All right, everyone, my distinguished guests, we would love to begin this session. And we are grateful for your presence. You don't have to leave. <laughs> You're welcome to attend our session. It's going to be amazing. Yes, look at Neil jumping up and down. It's the it's the end of the day, folks. We can take this super chill. It's all good. Enjoy your afternoon. I know it's a marathon. Zero Project is, if it's anything, it is a, a wealth of opportunity to connect and to find new hope, new energy, new joy. Just allow the last few people. Goodbye. Thank you for being here. Last few folks are going to head on out. All right, here's what we got in for you today. We are so excited to bring to you six new disability innovations that are making their journey to all parts of the world. It has been my distinct pleasure and honor to lead a program called Scaling Solutions. And this is one of those fancy yet amazing programs that allows new businesses, new initiatives, new ideas to take root in local communities and yet communicate and find a voice throughout the world. Uh, my name is Anthony, Dr. Anthony, but we can just go with Anthony since the end of the day. Um, I'm wearing a blue jacket. I got graying hair. Uh, I'm American by birth, Norwegian by choice, I, I like to say. And uh, I'm here today to introduce six remarkable people. And I'm going to start with somebody that I have a lot of respect, a lot of admiration for. Uh, my dear friend and colleague, Mandy from Reach and Match. R Mandy, can you introduce yourself and all the wonderful work? Tell us your story. We want to hear everything. Thanks. Thanks, Anthony. So my name is Mandy. I'm reflecting on my education journey through Hong Kong, US and Australia. I was always worried that about not fitting in. Oops, there's the PowerPoint is not ready yet. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry. So this experience taught me something important. No matter where we are in the world, we always wanted to be included. But do you know that less than 10% of the countries have laws that make sure everyone is included in the country? In Australia, despite 89% of the children with disabilities attend mainstream schools, but 70% of them experience isolation. However, this is not just the issues in Australia, it's a global challenge. I'm Mandy Lau, founder of Rich and Match. I'm a young Asian woman, short hair, wearing glasses and a black dress. As a designer, I'm really passionate about education and inclusion. I was wondering what true inclusion looked like. And inclusion is such a complex topic for adults. And how do we teach this for children? Although many of you will agree that children with disabilities should have the same rights as other children, but the legal framework always falls behind the real need of inclusive education. Assistive technology, which is wonderful, support adults with disabilities. But what about young children? As a mother with two toddlers, they need more than just digital interface. They need tangible and engaging experience. That's why I developed Reach and Match. It tackles these challenges by translating inclusion into fun and interactive play. It breaks down barriers, making inclusion tangible and enjoyable for all children. It's an inclusive and multi-sensory program with the Braille features. So it can maximize the engagements and social inclusion. And our program is supported by the rigorous research adaptable to diverse cultural contexts and it maximized learning outcomes and social well-being. We also developed comprehensive training to help minimize the challenges in inclusive teaching. I know that many of you may think that integrating such a new program into the school curriculum is very complicated. Yes, it needs adaptation and learning. And that's why I collaborate with the educators to develop this aligned with the early learning framework. 
That means teachers can easily adapt into the school curriculum. Years ago, without any business background, I was so struggled to turn this research into a reality. But the impact was real, and I'll never forget the smiles of the children. Like a girl learning Braille for the first time, a father amazed to see his child play with other kids, and a boy who is blind teaching me how to play the games without knowing I was the creator of the game. These are the most beautiful and rewarding experience for me. Fast forward to today, we are so proud to say that Reach and Match has reached over 35,000 children in 100 schools across eight countries. And we are so amazed that we are recognized with over 12 awards and endorsed by the Australian government DFAT in 2019. And we also formed successful partnership with UNICEF while wishing to reach more disadvantaged children in developing countries and emergencies. And our evaluations found that children with disabilities have improved their school readiness. They are participating more in the classroom and children with and without disabilities are not just interacting, but they're learning from each other. And teachers gain confidence and a new sense of empowerment. What I have learned from this journey is profound. Inclusion doesn't need to be complicated. It can be fun, engaging, and authentic for everyone. To scale this impact to the next level, I would love to invite you to be part of our journey and let's bring more fun to children's learning. Thank you. Mandy, my gosh, I'm getting chills when you you close that out. It was really powerful. And uh, I love that scene whenever you described it. In my mind's eye, I was imagining you sitting there with that child and that child teaching you about the device that you invented. It's kind of like all the sitcoms whenever there's something chaotic happening in the background and the main characters are just oblivious of what's happening. I just I think it's fantastic. What a joy and what a, a, a wonderful story about a struggle that you had as an entrepreneur to overcome and to become what reach and matches today you you should be very proud of your work i'm very proud of you next we have an equally amazing human being uh victor martinez from institute jocomente i always pronounce that horribly my portuguese is a nightmare so you're gonna have to do better uh you'll have to show me how it's done victor the floor is yours thank you Human connections don't happen on their own. Are you going to talk about it? Yes or not? Are you ready? Yes. yes. Okay. Woo. Okay. okay. <laughs> Go. My name is Victor. Um, I represent Instituto Jo Clement um, from Brazil, the Institute. It's an uh, important institute for to share the information about the people with intellectual disability hurrier disease and autism. But today, ah, ah, oh, my description, sure. <laughs> I am a white man. I'm in blue jacket too. I wear glass. But, and then, uh, the best. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and in the last decade in Brazil, the, the enrollment to grow up to 100%. It's a good note. Today in Brazil, I have almost 1 million people with disability enrolled in the fundamental school. Okay, it's a good note, you know? Yes. But my, mis my biggest mistake ever was thinking that inclusive education in Brazil was solved because the increasing enrollments the students with disabilities. Next slide. In reality, the qualitative data show us that there has been a positive impact on literacy, especially in reducing the illiteracy rate. Show us in the screen, for example, the people with disability, the literacy rating is almost 20%. It's terrible not. No, it's crazy and true. But 
uh, but we are working to change this scenario because we have in Brazil and the other parts of the world too, I think, the, for example, specific laws and um, research in the scientific studies and the two elements together, it's possible to create and to improve the new solution for the human technology or the assistive technology. But in our, ah, okay, the photo. <laughs> but and the, the, in the last decade, we, we built the, our experience. We started in 2011. We have in the different moments, we commit mistakes a lot. We learn a lot for the people with disabilities. But in, in, in particular, to, uh, I would like to, to share the, the Luana history, the, the girl in the screen. She's a girl with intellectual disability and dreams of becoming a judge. It's a big challenge, you know? But before participating in the specialized education service, she thought this was impossible. After years developing our program, with us, Luana improved her social skills, academic skills, it's more important, and built her autonomy. And today, she, uh, she thinks that her dream is possible. I think it's, it's important to say. Design, dream, is what makes us human, everyone. And it's possible to restore this right to many other people, like Luana. It's a uh, core than our job. But uh, the work we are doing with the school where Luana studies in being replicated and the other institution having the third steps is then the steps is in the first moment we study of this scenario, application of questionnaires in the focus group with teachers and the other actors participating in the process. And the second moment, we have the support and training for teachers and the other professions. We have the, the our material of the our experience in, in the good practice. But we listen the first time, the the teachers and the the families, and create and the customized purpose for the each people with intellectual disabilities. It's important. the The job is it's always individual. And the last moments we have the monitoring and implementation the, the process together uh, with the, the different partnership. Okay. Uh, yesterday, I heard from, from Carola the Discovery and specific presentation. It's um, a good information. Uh, she said, great idea, low cost, I think. Uh, we we are in the in the good way because our our purpose is to to spend our idea and the practice for the other parts of the the world. Uh, they start and expanding for the cities near the São Paulo city because state São Paulo state have more than forty million people. It's a big opportunity, but in, maybe in the second moment and in the third moment. Uh, we would like to expand it for the other regions, areas, the Brazil and the Latin America, because the culture is the Sims, I think. But I, I would like in the, the last moment, the, the reflection is the, is the base of our action in the Institute. Education is a right for our individuals, include those who need support the most. We are all responsible for building and a way to activate. Is it? Thank you, Victor. Let's give Victor a round of applause. I've had the privilege to work in many countries in the global south over the last 20 years of my career, and I continually reminded of the capacity for innovation that occurs in countries like Brazil. And when I think about the future of inclusion, when I think about the future of disability rights, I keep coming back to the idea that the future isn't in my country of Norway. The future isn't in the United States where I was born. The future is 
in Brazil. The future is in your hands because you are championing things in a way that a lot of other countries still are struggling with. And I love seeing what you're able to do in the context of, uh, of your work. It's really, really beautiful. So very, very well done, Victor. I'm going to turn now to my colleague, Margaret. Margaret's from Zero Project. She has been holding the, she's the glue holding all of this together in so many respects. And so, Margaret, I'll turn it over to you to introduce our next fellow. Exactly, because Victor isn't the only person here who is allowing people to dream because dreaming is priceless and he just proved that you don't need a lot of money to fulfill your dreams and i think that marvela can tell us a little bit about how, how you can make your dreams come true especially if you are a girl or a woman with disability and you need the support of your community so marvela you're up Hello everyone, I'm grateful for this opportunity. I had a lovely experience learning new ways of thinking and doing things at the Scaling Solutions Fellows Program. Like Dr. Anthony always said, it will be messy, but it will always work out in the end. <laughs> I have a secret to tell you. Writing this presentation brought back bittersweet memories. Bitter because up until now, more than 8 million women and girls, particularly those living with disabilities in my country, Nigeria, still are marginalized, do not have access to technology, they lack skills and support, and they cannot break the shackles of extreme poverty in which they find themselves. Sad but true. Sweet because of how far I've come with this initiative. More than 6,000 marginalized women and girls have benefited so far from my initiative. My name is Marvela Odili. I am the founder and CEO of Save Our Needy Organization, a nonprofit and non governmental organization. For more than 10 years, I've been working actively to end extreme poverty gender inequality and reduce inequalities in Africa, particularly focusing on women and girls, having working for a more inclusive and just world. We all have heard of poverty, but do we know the effects of extreme poverty? Do you know that it leads to depression and mental disability? Imagine this scenario, a woman having a little baby, going without food for four whole days, she and her baby. Looking tired, hopeless and helpless, this woman straps her baby to her back, puts stashes of water in a pan, places it on her head and sets out to the market. She heads to the market in a bid to sell this sachet of water and make money to provide for herself and her child. After hours of barely making sales, she collapses. Fortunately for her, she did not die because people ran to her aid, people who saw what happened. This is not a story that I made up. It is a true life story that happened recently in Lagos, Nigeria. In 2018, I launched Project Empower to strengthen the capacity of marginalized women and girls in urban slums and rural areas to enable them earn a sustainable income and break free from extreme poverty using technology and innovative communication methods. This project focuses on empowering marginalized women and girls to gain financial independence, change their mindset from a mindset of victims to a mindset of leaders, and help them lead productive lives through in-person and online training and support, such as psychosocial and mentorship support. My initiative gives marginalized women and girls access to technology using smartphones, desktops, and laptops. Women and girls living in extreme poverty with disabilities, living with HIV, and survivors of gender-based violence are trained on digital skills, entrepreneurship, and leadership development. They learn to use technology for research, marketing, and to earn a sustainable income. 
My initiative promotes inclusion, increased participation of marginalized women and girls, and improved quality of life. I have taken an innovative approach by making women and girls the center of this project. They are the champions of change and the drivers of change of this project. Also, my focus is not on building and developing the skills of these women, but also working on their mindset because these people, these women and girls, they feel hopeless, helpless, like they can never make it in life. So I work on their mindset to be able to change it from a victim of a mindset of victims to a mindset of leaders. I also engage trainers who live with disabilities to motivate the participants of this project. Some of the challenges I've faced so far are that mental disability is not, mental disability is not given enough uh, focus as much as physical disability. Also, there is a stigma and negative attitude of the society towards these women and girls with disabilities, leaving them behind in development. I've also had difficulty raising funds for the project. Project Empire has transformed and impacted many lives. Halima, for example, 25 years old, a single mother, secondary school leaver, single mother by choice, by circumstances and not by choice. She has three young children, all below the age of five years, suffered from domestic violence for many years, leading to depression. She had no sustainable means of income because she lacked skills and support. But after completing training, and benefiting from mentorship, Halima now runs her own online graphic design business. She can earn money and take care of herself and her children. That is one success story. My aim with this initiative is to tell the story of so many more Halimas who are no longer victims, but leaders in their communities. Halima today employs people. Adishola is another success story which gladdens my heart. She's an adolescent who was raped at a very young age. But the culture of silence that we have in Africa, Nigeria particularly, made her not speak out for many years. This greatly affected her mental health. My initiative provided her with a free space to freely express herself, get psychosocial support, and gain skills. Today, Adeshola is a much happier child, and she empowers other girls in her community. It may seem that I'm ignoring men and boys with disabilities, but let's face it, women and girls are worse hit when it comes to discrimination, stigmatization, and marginalization. They have less opportunities to access technology, education, and even finance to survive. This initiative has taught me so many things, but most of all, it has taught me that empowering marginalized women and girls has a ripple effect on their families and their communities. And this leads to economic change. I have learned truly that women and girls have the power to change the world. Beneficiaries of my initiative empower others in their communities. And this leads to a multiplier effect, which leads to sustainability. I hope to scale this project to all parts of Nigeria, the six geographical zones, and to other countries in West Africa, such as Togo, Ghana, and Burkina Faso. If this project has made any impact on you as much as it has made on me, I'll be very glad to discuss it with you after this presentation. Together, we can achieve a world with zero barriers. Thank you very much. I think that Marvala here saying that there shouldn't be a girl or a woman who feels like a victim, but feels like a leader is such a strong face to be set on this panel where we have so many wonderful leaders who are exceptional women, really. Each one of you is really a unique, massive leader who is changing the world. And with that said, I'm proud to announce another woman leader who will talk about sign language and stamps, Al Karao. Thank you very much, Margaret. 
I'm going to talk about science, technology, engineering and maths. But I request you. To forget about robots, rockets and spacecrafts for a moment. So are we ready? Yeah. OK. So science is not just about flashy gadgets or fancy careers. It's also the unseen wonder behind every delicious bite, every blooming flower and every colorful butterfly we see flying in our gardens. Science education is about igniting curiosity, fostering critical thinking about things that matter in our daily lives. So science education should be blooming in our backyards, classrooms, in this hall, in communities, and not locked away due to accessibility issues to anybody. It is tragic, but countless children around the world miss out on this opportunity. In my own country, less than 5% of deaf children attend school, less than 1% get higher education, and none are offered science subjects. No wonders jobs for the deaf remain unfilled, including the reserved ones in the government sector, and the silent talent remains silent and untapped. Now it's not a statistical issue. It is a human issue. And this is what we care to address at Indian Sign Language Enabled Virtual Laboratory of CSIR, Institute of Microbial Technology, Chandigarh. My name is Alka Rao. I'm a scientist. I am wearing a colorful Indian dress and wearing spectacles. I work on this project along with my three deaf friends, Digvijay Singh, the team lead, Hoshiar Singh, and Vivekanand. So picture this virtual laboratory, animated with experiments, hands-on explanation, the latest gadget demonstration, all presented in the language that you understand. And this is the heart of our project. A web platform made vibrant with a variety of digital content, comics, games, infographics, and videos, and we cater to a different learning levels, and we make all of it accessible in Indian Sign Language. Just like any research project, we have faced challenges, the first and the biggest was lack of science for science. So we cr started creating STEM vocabulary, sign by sign. A bulky dictionary will frighten anybody. So we craft sign only when we absolutely need it. We particularly take care to sync our sign to Greek and Latin roots of scientific words. We keep sign intuitive, accurate, and precise, and all the more important, harmonized. We care what exists, and we do not duplicate. And we have learned that making sign is not just art, not just science. It is a skill, imagination, a whole lot of collaboration, innovation, and inclusion. Strangely, but uh, most solution offered for deaf accessibility focus only on creating sign, sign, and more, more, more signs. But does that translate into access to knowledge or deaf empowerment? And this is where our project stands out. We stay focused on explaining concepts, invoking knowledge, sharing knowledge. For example, if we want to explain nutrition and about biomolecules, and we realize that the sign for fatty acid is missing, 
We only create one sign, the missing sign. And again, we don't stop here. We immediately put that sign into science, stories, and action. We integrate it into our workshops, talks, and activities. So don't rule out as the translation people. This project is trying to create an ecosystem of STEM accessibility around us, around all of all of us. The students, when we were trying to work with them in a studio, uh, the things were not working out. The moment Digvijay Hoshiar landed in my lab, our pace has gone exponentially. So when ambience is there and access is granted, transformation happened. Hoshiar, the boy on my team, loves science, the buzzing bees, the crackling stars, everything. And but he cannot hear. His school never gave him opportunity to study science. So when he joined us a year ago, he needed everything to be shown to him. Interpreters, my PhD student really had hard time, you know, satisfying him is, uh, with his curiosities about centrifuge, microbes, fume wood, cultures, everything that he saw in my lab. And today, Hoshiar is a fluent deaf science educator in my team. Standing at the podium, Hoshiar uses his hands to talk, to paint pictures about anything and everything like how phone works, the bacteria divides, or food gets digested in the gut. December last year, he spoke the deep science of my lab on protein folding and unfolding at the BVS National Conference held at Gujarat. And trust me, the entire hall filled with the thunderous applause of 600 ants rising in celebration. Our program is earning trust of our collaborators, NGOs, and big brands now. In Karnal, a city in North India, we have built an astronomy lab for deaf kids, providing interesting experiments to try. Mr. Bhuvesh from Karnal tells me amazing things. Every kid comes every day more excited than the previous day. He says this lab and the virtual mod has made his teaching activity super easy. Last year, Royal Society of Chemistry collaborated with us and together we conduct, conducted a chemistry workshop for deaf children in our lab at Chandigarh. Three days, eight experiments, 57 deaf children. And when they left, children remembered every new sign and details of experiments that Digvijay taught them in my lab. Digvijay Singh, my team lead, has made possible 400 videos, created 100 new signs, and helped 10,000 plus deaf friends learn with us online and offline. Every number is a friend's life changed and a dream started. People are loving our work and we are overwhelmed. We cannot answer all these messages yet. We are just six and we are working hard. Sign in STEM are still in infancy. And STEM is beyond cultural limitation anyways. Dick Vijay, my lead, is convinced that STEM is our finest opportunity to unify the sign cultures and create a truly zero barrier culture of STEM education. So for the joy of learning, we urge together, let us sign together, and let us sign together for science. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alka. I think that the community of deaf people has something in common with the community of people with visual impairments. I remember a story about people unable to learn mathematics because they couldn't use the symbols in Braille years ago. And right now we are noticing that so many people have so many difficulties with learning science and their right to education is not being able to be exercised. So people like you are really making a difference for everyone so they can educate themselves. And with that said, I'm leaving it up to our professor here. 
<laughs> Thank you so much, Margaret. This is just such a fun uh, thing to get to do. I'm really joyous with seeing all the wonderful ideas that have come out of this program. And I'm particularly excited about the work that Ignacia has been doing in the Sordera Institute. And I've had the privilege of getting, know, getting to know her over many breakfasts at our hotel. It's been really exciting to learn more about her work and who she is as a person. And I think she's here to share even more today. Thank you, uh, Ignacia. Thank you so much, Anthony, Margaret, for this opportunity. Well, I have a confession to make, so I hope it won't leave this room, <laughs> please. <laughs> for many years, I didn't trust nor like inclusive education for deaf children at all. This may seem very politically incorrect, you know, because all our laws in Chile are pointing towards inclusive education. Currently in Chile, there are only six schools for deaf children, special schools, across five of our 16 regions. The remaining 2010 deaf students are enrolled in 1,025 mainstream schools. So, if you can see, only 20% of them have access to sign language interpreters or deaf adult role models, leading to many students growing up isolated. My name is Ignacia Soval. I am a middle-aged woman with brown and gray, and gray hair dressed in black and white. And for more than 25 years, I've been working for and with the deaf community back in Chile. And let me explain you why I didn't trust the inclusive education for deaf children. It's because I didn't like the way it's been implemented in my country. We know that deaf children and youth have the right to receive quality education and thrive in inclusive spaces. However, we are aware that unfortunately in most Latin American countries, including of course my own country, regulations regarding the inclusion of deaf students into mainstream schools are not fulfilled at all. Or sometimes only minimum standards are achieved, making it impossible to provide quality education for them. You might think that including deaf students is costly due to the resources needed and the low numbers of students, in Chile, for example, there are approximately 3,500 deaf children of school age, a small fraction compared to the overall student population. However, achieving effective inclusion, inclusion doesn't always mean higher expenses. By making reasonable accommodations in cultural and institutional practices through collaborative efforts, we can promote inclusion without breaking the bank. At the Fundación Enseñas del Instituto de la Sordera, Deafness Institute, our mission is to advance inclusive education and society for Chile's deaf community. We support mainstream schools with deaf students aiming to enhance the lives of children like Juan, who I'm going to tell you his story. We work to end exclusion in schools, support the efforts on promoting the best quality of education possible for all our students in spite of their needs. Let me tell you about Juan. He, he was diagnosed late uh, as a deaf since he lived in a rural area. He could not access um, early education, his family never knew anything about deaf culture or sign language. At the age of six, he was enrolled in the closest school for from home, which didn't have proper ad adaptation for his needs. And for years, Juan was the only deaf student at the school and in his family and in his community. So please take a moment to think about this. 
what what he felt about it. I'm sure everyone here feels frustrated when we cannot communicate properly when we are away from home. It's my my experience with speaking in English a lot. Mm -hmm. So imagine to live all your life struggling with those barriers and challenges. In our organization, we aim to support Juan and other deaf children in Chile, and hopefully soon also in neighboring countries of our region. We provide assistance to teachers and professionals at Juan School and use tailored methods to help him grow socially, emotionally, cognitive, cognitively, and be able to see he, him, and other deaf children thrive. Thank you. It's really hard for me to say anything after that, Ignacia. This is just so, so wonderful. Thank you for sharing that. I think we're all honored to hear about this kind of work. I will turn to our last presenter, and I got to tell you guys, you're in for a treat because Sebastian is one of the the best storytellers I have heard in quite some time. And he's got a powerful way of communicating the work that he's doing there at the Soraki Foundation. So Sebastian, I'm going to turn it over to you. I see you blushing already. Yeah, <laughs> I've set the bar very high. Let's hear it. Thank you, Anthony. Who here? really enjoys it when you have the information you need right at your fingertips. <laughs> you Google since 2023, we have access to artificial intelligence. Well, there's some stuff uh, you still cannot find. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure that also you in the audience know how human rights treaties are monitored, including disability treaties. But most of us have no idea how our countries measure up with respect to these international human rights standards. Well, I'm here to tell you that until today, all reports for human rights treaties, including for disability rights, are presented in traditional document formats, such as this I'm showing. Well, many of us might have encountered long file, we just really want to close it up again, uh, right? Um, PDFs, long word processor formats, which make it very difficult to access, analyze, or to use for monitoring. In Latin America and the Caribbean alone, 17 countries are signatories to a regional convention on disability that has already gone through three reporting cycles using these traditional formats accumulating loads of data that is not searchable. And globally, human rights reporting mechanisms, including those of the United Nations, are often over four years behind in examining data that is submitted by member states. So we have proof that it is really hard to stay up to date when data is not accessible. My name is Sebastian. I'm a male with uh, short hair and beard and a gray suit. For the last four years, I have been supporting a data platform called the InDashboard. And every day I am puzzled about why it is so hard to find statistics and data on the lives of persons with disabilities. Most of us know that many of our own countries fall short in complying with inclusive policies. 184 countries adhere to the CRPD. Many also adhere to regional conventions. And of course, there are countless national disability laws. But we know there is a huge gap between what's mandated by conventions and national laws and what's actually being delivered to citizens. Thankfully, citizens around the globe are raising the bar for states to use evidence in their policymaking. Stakeholders know they need transparent access to information, whether they are advocates or decision makers. And if you think about it, in almost every area of human activity, information technology is already used to provide insights based on existing data. Well, the same may be done for information on human rights and inclusion. 
What we're missing so far is an online platform to help source, analyze, and publish this information. This is why we have designed the in dashboard to empower countries to show their progress while also holding states accountable for addressing existing gaps and putting into action the recommendations provided by experts and civil society. In the slide, I'm showing a map, a clickable map of Latin America and the Caribbean, uh, which may be used to access reports uh, previously presented by these uh, states. Since 2023, the 17 countries belonging to the Organization of American States have adopted the IN dashboard as the official data platform for disability reports. And all the data from previous years is, is also online. The IN dashboard makes it easier to access information on the indicators used to measure human rights commitments. It fac facilitates sharing information with the public. And most of all, it really supports engagement of key stakeholders around common issues by putting all the existing sources of information in the same platform. And I know what you're thinking, the in dashboard sounds ambitious and resource intensive. And you're right, it is a significant endeavor. In fact, the in dashboard is an investment in a more inclusive, equitable and accountable world. It's about harnessing the power of evidence to make better policy, then tracking commitments and potentially making a lasting impact on the lives of millions of people. So let me ask you, have you ever been alone in a room and after a while you begin to feel like you're being watched? <laughs> a spooky feeling. And I've changed the names uh, for this story, but let me tell you, this is how Gabriel, the government worker, must have felt when he wrote my country's last report on disability rights. He knows he has lots of eyes on him, so he's hiding behind stacks of papers writing his report. <laughs> but he's accountable, right, to politicians, to international donors, to the press, to civil society, and the list goes on. Anyway, Gabriel and his colleagues get to defend their official report before an expert committee. Uh, but in the upcoming days to the examination, one of the experts on the committee, Liliana, the lawyer, uh, she once told me she makes she wakes up thinking about disability rights, uh, goes to bed thinking about disability rights, a wonderful woman. So she gets on a Zoom call with us and says she's just been using the in dashboard to compare our country's report to various shadow reports and that she has some questions. There we are, Raul, my colleague who's in, in the audience as well, uh, myself and other civil society colleagues, hearing what we already knew, uh, that there, there's a lot missing from the official report, key data that is not there, and little mention of challenges and weaknesses on how the state is going to face them going forward. That same week, officials read statements with stern faces about so-called impressive progress in the lives of persons with disabilities in almost every field of public policy. But persons with disabilities themselves in the room are frustrated. They point out what they actually experience every day on the streets, in schools, in their workspaces. Liliana and the other experts fill in the gaps as well, but their knowledge is limited by the general lack of relevant, disaggregated, updated official data. This scenario is much more frequent than we can know. And it's happening also for women's rights, for indigenous rights, and is especially crucial when these intersect with barriers to disability inclusion. Of course, we were also delighted to hear from Liliana that the in-dashboard did help her to see the data and compare the reports, and that through this insight, she was able to provide the country with more useful and incisive recommendations. But we also agree that the majority of governments can and should be doing much more for persons with disabilities, and they do not do it because they do not feel the pressure 
either from experts, from organized civil society, from the press, from multilateral organizations, because they know that none of them have sufficient information to keep them accountable, to make an impact based on evidence. We call on you to bring the in dashboard to your region right now. And we can make sure that what is written in our human rights conventions can be tracked and monitored. So we can know as precisely as possible what we all need to do so these commitments can become a reality around the world. Sebastian, I think I could listen to you talk about human rights reporting all day long. It's remarkable how you take such a intrinsically dry subject and bring it to life so vividly. It's beautiful. Although I never want to see that Word document ever again. That just triggered me like back to my, you know, writing my doctorate and looking at the word count and going, I have to take it from that many to that many? It's not possible. Look, I want to show you what the future of disability innovation looks like. It looks like Mandy and her work with Reach and Match. It looks like Victor, Marvella, Dr. Alka, Ignacy, and Sebastian. This is the future of disability innovation. And we want everyone in this audience to be part of that future too. So if you enjoy working with this kind of ideas, if you enjoy working with disability innovations and finding ways of taking it into the future, I want to invite you to join us during our webinars that we're going to be holding in the, over the next few weeks. If you go to the Zero Project website and you check in with us, we're doing several public webinars that's going to help inspire you to think differently about how disability innovations work and how we can transfer them to new areas, new regions, and new localities. I want to thank deeply and sincerely the folks who made this possible. Atos, the Scubermay Foundation, GIZ and BMZ, Enable India, and of course, our very own Zero Project Foundation. You guys are the reason we're here. We thank you sincerely from the bottom of, my heart, of our hearts. And I want everyone in this audience to come up and meet our wonderful fellows. They have done incredible work to be here today and give them that love. Thank you so much. I'll see you all soon.